Buenos días, good morning. I would like to thank everybody for coming and in particular the ambassador and his wife. And uh, I have the honor of presenting Governor Flug. She has uh, studied in the Hebrew University and then got a PhD from Columbia University. And now she has a very difficult job as, as Governor of the Central Bank. And you have the floor, Governor. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'll try to tell you sort of from 30,000 feet the story of the Israeli economy. It's a small group, so if there are any uh, sort of questions or need to clarify something on the way, I'll be happy to answer and then we'll have some time for if you have any questions or things that you would like me to expand on. So as economists, the first numbers we look at are uh, growth of GDP. But what I put here is the per capita GDP, because uh, one big difference between Israel and, for example, Spain is the rate at which population grows. And that makes a, makes a difference. So just uh, so do you, that you can follow, Israel will always be marked in blue. And Spain, just for comparison here and there, in uh, yellow. Uh, and generally, one can see from this picture two facts. One is that we're all part of the global economy. So we move generally together, and the cycle uh, is uh, very much aligned. Uh, but you can also see some differences. Generally, uh, Israel did relatively well during the crisis, which means we have been affected, but relatively moderately and for a relatively short period of time. You can see the, uh, the slump in 2009 and the rapid recovery thereafter. And generally, we've been growing uh, a little bit uh, more rapidly than uh, the advanced, the average advanced economies. Uh, you can also see the sharp slump, but also the sharp recovery of the uh, of the Spanish economy, which I'm sure you know much more about than I do. But just for comparison. Uh, just to sort of give a sense of where we are in terms of the standard of living, uh, when we compare the per capita income in PPP terms adjusted uh, of different countries, you can see that actually Israel and Spain are just around the same number, 34,000, around $34,000 a year, which is substantially below OECD and certainly be below the US, for example, for comparison, so just to get a sense of uh, where we are. Uh, the main reason why economies move together is that uh, at least Israel is a very small and open economy and we're very much affected by what's happening in the global economy and in particular what is happening in the uh, world trade. And you can see that generally the Israeli exports and world trade, which is marked here in red, move very much together. Uh, but you can also see that in the last few years, the Israeli export has been somewhat lower. So there is some underperformance of Israeli exports compared to the world trade. Now, this picture actually sort of masks a, a little bit more complex picture, and that is that our exports of services, which are mostly high-tech services, R&D services, and so on, are doing very, very well. In fact, they're growing much faster faster than the world trade in services, but our uh, exports of goods, which is uh, mostly industrial uh, in, in industry, is doing uh, less uh, than world trade in goods. So that's where actually uh, the erosion of competitiveness related to the exchange rate that I'll get to uh, later on is affecting our industry. So this picture is a little bit more complex than what you see here. 
Uh, the Israeli, uh, I, I already mentioned that the Israeli economy has done relatively well with a relative uh, mild cycle. The main uh, force or driver of growth in the last few years has been private consumption. You can see that in the orange part of this uh, uh, contributors to growth. And when you look actually since the crisis, you see that this, or, or especially in the last four years, the contribution of consumption to growth has been the dominant factor in maintaining the level of activity relatively, uh, at a relatively high uh, level. And that was supported by policy, namely by monetary policy and by fiscal policy. And that actually helped us to continue a relatively strong growth in the face of a weak global economy. So the global economy has been weak, therefore exports had been weak, and the growth of consumption sort of compensated for that to maintain a relatively high level of, uh, of activity. Uh, the, that's the positive uh, side. The somewhat uh, uh, less uh, positive side of consumption-led growth is that it's usually uh, lower in terms of the level and also when you look at the effect for, for the longer term, so a, a consumption-led growth doesn't uh, guarantee uh, the potential future growth because it's less investment, uh, so it's, there is less of uh, uh, investment in expanding your growth potential for the future. And also generally, exports tend to be with higher productivity. That's where you get your comparative advantage uh, show up. So it's, it's good to have the ability to sort of smooth the cycle through consumption, but in terms of future growth, uh, we would like to see a more balanced uh, uh, growth uh, to guarantee sort of future uh, growth. Um, the, the fact that the economy continued growing at a fairly high pace is reflected in the labor market and actually that's, I would uh, say, a very positive aspect of the, of the current economic situation and it's reflected in the decline in unemployment. Our unemployment rate, the latest reading, which is from the beginning of 2017, for the unemployment rate of people aged 25 to 64 is 3.7% and it's the lo low unemployment even though we have more people actually getting into the labor market so we have an increased rate of participation. Uh, people are joining the labor market, including from some groups that generally tend to have lower participation rate. Uh, we have two communities that tend to have relatively less and enga lower engagement in the labor market. One is the ultra-Orthodox. They're very religious, uh, especially men, who tend to uh, study the Torah and, and, uh, and participate less in the labor market. And we have within the Arab community, uh, women tend to have lower rates of participation for various reasons. But we do see some increase also in the entrance of these groups into the labor market. By the way, the group that had the sharpest increase in their participation are the ultra-Orthodox women. So we've seen their quite a rapid growth of entry to the labor market. Though I have to say in parenthesis that it's not full employment, that they tend to have uh, very large families, very, a lot of young kids, so it's a bit difficult to sort of juggle uh, employment and, and raising very large families. Anyway, so the picture of the labor market has been relatively strong. We see entrance, we see growth of employment, more in the services areas than in industry, which is uh, related to the picture that I showed earlier on. Um, comparing the level of unemployment to various countries, by the way, this is the average number for the 2016, so it's a bit higher than in the previous slide, but I guess you know uh, this picture, and here uh, again our uh, unempl low unemployment sort of stands out. 
and the fact that we have a relatively tight labor market is also reflected in growth of wages uh, which have been growing in the business sector by some over three percent a year and that's over the last three years so we start actually seeing some shortages in some occupations in some areas especially in the highly skilled technical areas but uh, this is a reflection of a tight labor market and that also uh, is what is uh, helping consumption to be sustained because you have higher employment, higher wages, greater uh, labor income and that supports uh, uh, the growth of consumption together with some growth in the credit that I'll mention later, uh, consumer credit, and there is some wealth effect from housing prices going up. So there are some other elements as well that support consumption. But the main driver is the increase in the uh, labor income, which is basically sort of a solid source for a growth of, uh, of um, a consumption. What happened in 2003? Why the big growth? Okay, in 2003, actually, we had two, uh, two events that sort of coincided to lead the economy into a recession. Uh, one, or I would say the major, was what we call the Second Intifada, which started in the uh, end of 2000 and went on. And that was basically, there was a lot of uh, terrorist uh, incidents and uh, there, it actually had a fairly uh, strong effect on the economy. Um, it was a very intense period of, uh, of insecurity within, the within Israel. And the second was the burst of the high-tech bubble. So leading, if you see before that, by 2000, wages were very much uh, up because of the uh, fueled by the tech, the, uh, the pumping of the high-tech bubble, and then came the burst, and then came the decline. So the two things sort of coincided to create uh, this uh, recession. By the way, uh, when I look at this picture, beside looking at what is happening right now, you can also see that uh, real wages in Israel are quite flexible and you can see that they're very responsive to the cycle which I think is actually an, a strength of Israel because the, the market is functioning so when you when we had the high-tech bubble initially they went up but then when the correction come actually came we actually saw a sharp decline so the market is reacting uh, in adjusting wages which means means that there is less adjustment in employment. So that's, I think, a positive aspect of a flexible labor market that is sort of hinted to uh, if you look at this graph. Well, so, and maybe if we already uh, stop at this, uh, at this graph, um, we used to have, a, until the late 80s, this public sector was leading the wage uh, of the economy. Now it's the opposite uh, way, and actually the wage agreements in the public sector follow or mimic what is happening in the private sector. So when this uh, occurred, when there was a decline in the wages of the private sector in 2002, the wage agreement in the public sector, actually the uh, uh, employees were willing to take a wage cut, which mimicked what happened in the private sector. So that was a development that was actually quite interesting and very much in contrast to the way the labor market was until 88 or something like that. So. Well, you know, we had our uh, crisis in 84, 85, hyperinflation, and that led to quite a lot of changes in the structure of the labor market. 
Um, okay, one uh, important challenge I would say for the Israeli economy have been housing prices. Uh, if we look from 2007, you can see that we're leading in the rise of housing prices. Prices went up uh, from 2009 actually, no, from they went from 2007 up by 120%. You can see this Spain down there. Uh, I had a, another slide, which you don't see here, is if you take it 10 years uh, back, actually the picture looks completely different. So in Israel, until 2007, we had a gradual 10-year decline in housing prices and then things turned around. In Spain, as you know, things were somewhat a different pattern. Um, but that's certainly a concern. It, it's a concern both in terms of uh, financial stability, mortgages are going up, and also in terms of the affordability and the ability of young people to actually afford buying a home. And in Israel, there is a very small uh, rental market, so it's not that there is really an option to, to have sort of a, a long-term rent contract as an alternative. So this is definitely a major social issue. If we look, just to get a little bit of perspective, a longer-term perspective, these are real uh, housing prices. Uh, no, it's not real, actually. It's nominal housing prices. So you can see that generally housing prices tend to have sort of very long fluctuations. You can see here the decline that I talked about in the 10 years preceding uh, the increase, and you can see the current increase, which is quite sharp. I should say that in the last few years, uh, in the last few months, we've seen some deceleration, actually there were some months that prices even went down. So we, there is a question mark whether we've seen the peak and it's already sort of getting uh, to change the trend. It's too early to say, but uh, obviously we're following it very closely because it's both from financial and from affordability point of view, it's a very important uh, issue. Uh, I'll say a few words about uh, the Bank of Israel policy, and we're an inflation targeter. Our inflation target, which is set by the government, is set to be between 1 and 3 percent. And what you can see here are two things. One is that inflation has been lower or below the target since uh, early 2014, which means we've already m been missing our target for two and a half years. Uh, and But you also see, and I think this is the positive side, that the expectations of the public going forward are that inflation will get back into the target range. Uh, and the expectations have always actually been within the target range, which I think I take it to imply that uh, people understand that, one, that a lot of the forces that put inflation lower were of a temporary nature and that the Bank of Israel is um, a determined to get inflation back to the target range. Now, some of the factors that uh, pushed inflation uh, down in the last few years had been uh, oil prices, commodity prices, and so on. But also, there has been an effort by the government to reduce the prices that it controls. So there was a series of price reductions in various areas, including water, uh, insurance, uh, uh, basic insurance. Uh, there was a reduction of 1% in the VAT tax. So all of these are factors that are sort of one-offs. And when we conduct our monetary policy, we're not concerned about a temporary effect of these factors on the inflation because it's not uh, reflecting something that we think that we should correct for. Um, it's somewhat different than the concerns that had been here in Europe 
less so now, but earlier on, that of a deflation that is the result of low demand. So we have not had low demand, we have a strong labor market, and so these factors we were less concerned of. The other factor that is still in place right now is the fact that our currency has been strengthening or appreciating, and that by itself is translated to lower in inflation on all the imported or tradable goods. So that's something that is still with us, and the exchange rate has been a concern, both in terms of inflation, but also in terms of the eroding competitiveness of the economy. Uh, so this is the picture of inflation, and uh, that's ov obviously one of the very important elements that we look at when we think about our monetary policy. By the way, just to, to state the other objectives that are very clearly specified in our central bank law, so the first objective is maintaining price stability over time, and subject to that, supporting the government's uh, uh, goal of high growth, uh, uh, low unemployment, and also uh, supporting financial stability, which is an objective that sort of gained importance after the global financial crisis, and I'm sure I don't have to say much about that in this audience. Uh, another, uh, okay, so I mentioned already the exchange rate, and that has been actually for the Bank of Israel, I would say, the biggest challenge uh, over the last few years. What you see here in dark blue is the nominal effective exchange rate, which is the exchange rate of the shekel vis-a-vis -vis the basket of currencies that we uh, trade with. And you see there in the green line up there the exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the euro and in the dotted red line beneath, it's the exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Our trade generally is about one-third with Europe, one-third with the U.S., and one-third with the rest of the world, uh, Asia, South America, and so on. So we're somehow in between and in the middle. Uh, but when we look at this uh, weighted average exchange rate, you see basically that it's trending very clearly down, which means that the, our currency has been strengthening. And, and the strengthening of, uh, of the shekel, I think, has um, few uh, explanations, and some of them are basically related to the relatively strong performance of the economy. Our growth has been quite strong. We have a current account surplus. So all of that are what we economists call fundamentals. And we obviously take that as given. And we don't think that we should try and sort of offset in, in any, uh, that in any way. However, there are also other factors at play uh, at this current period. And that's the fact that some of our trading partners partners actually engage in very, very accommodative uh, uh, monetary policy, primarily the ECB with the negative interest rate and with the program of, uh, of uh, QE, quantitative easing, and some other trading partners, Japan and so on. So we view the effect of the very accommodative policy of some of our trading partner as something that is sort of extraordinary and it's beyond what the fundamentals would justify. So we think that there is some excessive appreciation which is related to that and that's part of why we also respond in our policy uh, in the foreign exchange market that I'll say a word uh, in a minute. But anyway, this is the picture. And over the last two years, we had a nominal effective appreciation of some 15%, which means that our export sector find it harder and harder to, to compete. It's definitely a big uh, challenge. Usually you can, com you can deal with some appreciation by constant improvement in your productivity and your efficiency and so on, but 15% in two years, which come after 
uh, appreciation also in the past is is more than normally uh, a firm can deal with uh, just by improving efficiency. So, uh, and I already mentioned the increase in, in uh, housing prices and mortgages. So these are all the pieces of our, uh, of the picture that we look at when we conduct our, uh, our mon monetary policy and generally our, uh, the central bank policy. This is a very complicated picture, but I'll try to, to explain it sort of uh, layer by layer. Uh, these are the various components of our policy. So on the top panel, what you have is basically the interest rate. Our interest rate uh, has been uh, reduced from 2011 until uh, uh, May of 2015, where, it, uh, where we got to 0.1%, and this is where we are until now. So our interest rate is 0.1, and we also also made it clear that we will maintain a very accommodative stance of monetary policy until our inflation uh, environment is entrenched within our target range, which is 1 to 3 percent. We're not quite there yet. So this is the first component of our policy. The second component is the intervention in the foreign exchange market. I mentioned already that there are forces that are beyond the fundamentals, which is basically the policy of some of our trading partners that uh, cause a appreciation of our currency. There is one other factor that also contributes to the strength of our currency, and that's the fact that we started, uh, we found and started producing natural gas. And that has a lot of very positive uh, effects in terms of the price of, uh, of uh, energy in Israel, but the downside from the perspective of a central banker is that it adds extra pressure on an already appreciated currency. The government actually decided to deal with this extra pressure, which we economists call the Dutch disease, by deciding to create a sovereign wealth fund that will take some of the revenues that the government get from the taxation of this sector and uh, putting them in a sovereign wealth fund that will be invested abroad. But this will only start in probably a couple of years. In the meantime, the pressure on the exchange rate is not waiting for the creation of the sovereign wealth fund, so the Bank of Israel took upon himself to try and offset some of this pressure by also purchasing foreign exchange. So these are the little red bars there, which are the purchases that are basically offsetting the improvement in the current account coming from the production of natural gas. So the foreign exchange intervention uh, has been the second pillar of our policy. I would say that the foreign exchange intervention is the Israeli version of QE. So uh, in other countries, the, the central banks have been purchasing uh, government bonds to try and add additional accommodation around the lower, uh, the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound. So this is our form of QE. The third pillar of our policy has to do with the housing market and in particular with the, with the um, mortgage market. And uh, what we did in order to make sure that the uh, that the risks that are uh, building up in the mortgage market as a result of the very rapid expansion of mortgages, that these risks don't get out of hand. And in order to deal with that, because we also are, uh, have a role in financial stability and because the banking supervision is within the Bank of Israel, so we have the mandate to apply uh, um, macroprudential measures or restrictions basically in the uh, mortgage market. And there is a list here that you can see that is actually quite long of restrictions that we applied. For example, we limited the loan 
want to value the LTV to be 70%, it's 75% for first time home buyers, 70 from whoever wants to change their home, and 50% for investors, which are people that buy more than one home. We limited the payment to income, we limited the, within each mortgage you can take only one third at a variable rate, which basically uh, want, came to protect people from a very sharp increase in the repayments or in the interest payments once interest rates go up. So we applied a series of uh, measures which we think are very important to protect both the borrowers from overborrowing and also the banks doesn't make us the most popular uh, you know, guy on the block, but we think that it's important to sort of put these uh, safety valves early on, not to get to in trouble later. Uh, so I think this is really uh, what I wanted to say about monetary policy and let me now go even if we start at 30,000 feet uh, above ground we go even further and look at some sort of bigger longer term issues uh, in Israel in the Israeli economy and let me start with what uh, I see as are the forces behind the strengths of the economy and in particular the strength of the high-tech sector and the startup sector that I'm sure that you sort of are all to some extent familiar with. So uh, if we sort of try to sum up what are the main uh, uh, qualities uh, that Israel has that help the striving uh, high-tech sector, there are actually some international rankings that try to rank countries according to their innovation, and one ranking is Bloomberg. I think they rank some 150 countries or something like that, and the World Economic Forum also has some ranking, and we, we rank quite high, highly on those, and if I try to sort of take from these rankings what are the main uh, contributors to this high ranking, uh, it starts with the quality of uh, the academ academia, the universities, and the fact that they provide both the scientific basis, but also the scientists and the, the people with the technological uh, skills that are behind the developments in this sector. There is also a very important uh, element of collaboration between the universities and the industry. I'm sure that Shirley knows everything about it because she was very active in our, uh, our high-tech uh, and startup scene. Uh, actually, the governments help the universities set up subsidiaries that help commercialize the sort of maybe somewhat abstract ideas that are being uh, uh, produced in the universities. The government has also been very uh, supportive of the initial uh, setup of the venture capital industry. It came up with the uh, with a fund called Shirley Yozma, which put up the initial uh, uh, resources, which were matched by the private sector, and it's no longer needed. But early on, it was a very important sort of infrastructure to create the financing source for the industry. Uh, and then actually the venture capital industry uh, took off from there and now it's very developed. I, I should actually mention maybe two other things that are not mentioned in these international rankings but I think are important. One is that in some areas I think the need to deal with some challenges actually was an important, uh, gave an important push for innovation. And I'll give two examples. Uh, one is the development of the cyber security uh, industry. As you know, Israel is subject to all kinds of threats, including in the area of uh, cyber. And so the military was actually very uh, much, ha had to deal with that, had to develop 
the capabilities to actually defend uh, uh, Israel from these threats. And that saw the seeds of these capabilities that then people that served in the army started actually developing uh, products uh, uh, later on, civilian products, to, uh, to deal with that. So that's one example. The second example is water. You know that Israel is about half desert and uh, uh, when we grew up uh, in Israel we were always taught to turn off the uh, faucet when you brush your teeth in between so that you save water because we have a uh, water shortage. Well, we no longer have water shortage and the reason is because of drip irrigation, because of recycling water, we are leader in actually more than, I think it's 85 or 90 percent of water for agriculture is recycled. And we, re and we we are leading in the technology of desalination. So the phrase goes that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So I think this is just an example that this is the case. <laughs> Um, so I mentioned already the venture capital. It's uh, if we look as a proportion of GDP, it's, uh, it has the highest uh, share. Uh, I mentioned the um, the educated or the the, the lay, sorry the people with higher education. This is people with tertiary level education as a proportion of overall. By the way, here the uh, wave of immigrants from the former Soviet Union was very important in actually uh, bringing to Israel uh, technical skills that were very important for the development of the high-tech sector. Uh, and then if we look at the map overall, this is, we have some 5,000 startups in a variety of areas ranging, I mentioned already, uh, cyber security, but they're also in clean tech and in fintech and in pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth. Actually, when I sh showed this picture uh, about three weeks ago in Israel, I was told that I'm not, that I'm not up to date and that there are already 5,300. So I'm not sure. Uh, actually, there is one other element that I wanted to mention, which I think is also important, especially for the development of this uh, startup scene. You know, most startups actually end up failing out of the of the st small startups. Only a small proportion actually succeeds. We have in mind uh, something like Waze or Mobili that are great successes, but this is not how most uh, startup uh, end. And I think there is a cultural uh, element here that w people are willing to take risks. They're willing to try their innovative ideas. They're willing to fail. And then they learn from this process and try again. And I think there is something about this uh, cultural element that also sort of helps support the, this industry, which in some places, if you're very concerned about what it will do to your reputation if you tried and failed, you, you won't try. So I think there is also something of that nature that is uh, sort of help, helps this picture. Uh, when we look at the overall employment in the high-tech sector, it's about 9%. So uh, obviously the output is higher than 9%, but it's 9% of the, uh, of the uh, employment which is in this sector. It's the highest in uh, OECD countries, but it's still only 9%. So that's sort of to, to bear in mind that uh, it's a very important sector for the economy, but it is limited in terms of the employment that it uh, creates. Which actually brings me to the challenges that we face, and we do face uh, some challenges. Um, and the first thing is, we, as I mentioned, we have a very successful high-tech sector, but when we look at what is happening to productivity or to uh, output per worker in Israel, on average, 
macroeconomically uh, over time, we have a substantial gap vis-a-vis -vis the most advanced uh, OECD countries, and we're not closing that gap. And if I would look behind this picture, if I, if I look at different sectors, so the sectors that are very exposed to globally, that mostly cater to the global market, were up, up there with very, very high productivity. But when I look at the sectors that are inward looking, where most people are employed, which include retail and include construction and include the more local industries, and so on, they, there our productivity per worker is unimpressive to say it very mildly. So there is quite a lot of work to be done. And if I try to see what is behind the low productivity in the inward looking sectors, one is that we score quite poorly in the doing business index. I don't know if you're familiar with this index. It's an index, it's a composite index which is produced by the World Bank. And it basically looks at the a burden of bureaucracy and over-regulation. And in too many areas, we have too much bureaucracy, inefficient regulation, inconsistent, which makes it actually quite difficult for new businesses to set up. It takes a very long time to get your way through the uh, bureaucracy. Uh, the other ele important element is the fact that we are actually we have a relatively low capital per worker in the business sector, and it's related also the fact that to the fact that uh, our infrastructure uh, is insufficient, and I think there is complementarity between the level of infrastructure and investment by the private sector, and so I think. Uh, here, if the government w would invest more in infrastructure, that would also uh, catalyze private investment in capital. And the third element, which there is just one indicator here that I put on this graph, but there are others uh, as well, is that the level of the average uh, Israeli worker in terms of skills is not very impressive. Uh, and there are also wide disparities. It's, there, are, uh, there, are, there is large inequality also in the level of skills. And uh, so obviously the high-tech sector is enjoying very uh, capable, highly skilled, uh, with high technological skills. But the average Israeli doesn't come to the labor market with the skills that would, uh, that would make him or her uh, successful in the labor market of the 21st century. Um, okay, I, I think I can skip that and just say that as a result of that and the, the very uh, large inequalities in the level of skills, we also get fairly high inequality, lay, uh, income inequality, which is basically related to wage inequality, which is related to skill inequality. So I think this is really uh, one very big challenge. And to some extent, Israel is a dual economy. It has this extremely successful high-tech sector and somewhat less successful inward-looking local uh, industries. So that's sort of what I wanted to say about the Israeli economy. And just to end with a few figures of the economic relations between uh, Israel and Spain. So I picked uh, some numbers just to get a sense. Uh, so these are exports of goods. And you can see that actually imports from Spain to Israel are a, a bit over 1.6, one no, one 1.6 billion, more or less, and exports from Israel to Spain are about 900. And you can see the composition here. Uh, actually, not so much very high-tech uh, trade that I see in this, uh, in this graph. And then there is also a 
uh, trade in uh, uh, in services, and but that's very very small. Actually, I was surprised with how small it is. So I guess what we can take from there is that there is a lot of potential to increase uh, trade and also trade in services. Sorry, between uh, between Israel and Spain. So I think I'll stop here and be happy to sort of. Uh, uh, discuss some other issues if if you would like me to. Well, thank you, Governor. And uh, yeah, now let's open up for discussion. If anybody has any questions. Okay, Mr. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Governor, for the very, very first presentation. I'm the director of the program at the Federal Okay, uh, Mr. Gaynor, uh, I work for, uh, for a think tank on international relations. I direct the energy program, so I have to ask you about this uh, wonderful gas, uh, natural, natural gas purchase program. Uh, what is your advice? Or what do you think is going to happen? Do you, what, what's going to happen if you really start to export gas one day? That is, uh, we will see what's going to happen with that. Uh, how this will affect to your uh, monetary policy and, and, and all these schemes you, you have, uh, you know, introduced to us. And secondly, what's your opinion about the regulatory mess you are undergoing in, in, in Israel about this gas uh, thing, you know? What's your opinion on that, about competition and all that? I mean, because I think this is a, a something that really, you know, stacks the, the, the people coming from that side. You know, seeing people there making demonstrations because of this gas, you know, the young people, this is something strange for us. Thank you. Um, so, first, regarding the question of uh, what will be the effect if we, um, I guess, if we increase the production and start exporting uh, gas. So, actually, that's, first of all, it will be very good news in terms of the wealth of the country. Uh, the government take in terms of overall taxation from that sector will be somewhere around 55%. Uh, and about half of it will be in the sovereign wealth fund that will be uh, invested abroad. And the idea of the sovereign wealth fund is one, to actually to distribute the benefits to the future generations as well. So some, go, uh, some of the receipts go directly to the budget and the current generation is enjoying it. And the sovereign wealth fund will actually keep some of the benefits for the future generations. But another motivation was also to avoid exactly the downside of, uh, or the Dutch disease that could occur if you have a very high uh, export from a natural resource, which pushes your currency further up and makes it more difficult for the rest of the economy uh, to compete. So actually, I think the fact that we legislated the, uh, the um, gas, the sovereign wealth fund, before there was any money, actually, and that's important because it made it easier to legislate, uh, was a very important uh, uh, move, and that should take care of, of that particular issue. Now, regarding the process that led to the uh, scheme that was eventually adopted, there was a lot of discussion, internal discussion, I think healthy discussion, uh, uh, regarding what should be exactly the contract uh, uh, that will be signed with the developers of the uh, of the Leviathan, which is the big field that is being developed now. Uh, and I think the agreement that was reached was reasonable. You know, when you, you, when you negotiate, you never get exactly what you wanted, but I think the important uh, thing was to reach an agreement so that actually the field will be developed and there are massive investments that need to be, uh, to be taken uh, and, uh, and they, are, they actually started now developing the field. So I think it was not a very elegant process, I admit, and it was controversial, but I think the fact that w there was actually an agreement reached in, at the end, I think was the right thing to do. 
Also, it should be remembered that I, th I think there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of facts and misfacts in the public discussion. But the, I think the very important um, part that actually took place before the big controversy was the Shishinsky Committee, which was a committee that uh, decided about the level of taxation that would be levied on the sector. And I think that the 55 percent or so that I mentioned are within the international standards as to how much you tax this kind of natural resource and what should go to the to the people, which is the taxation, and what should be in the hands of the private sector who is actually developing the, the sector. I have to I have two questions. One is say uh, if you can uh, what is the policy in terms of the government for the inequality? Uh, what, what can be done? And the second is with regard to uh, balance of trade between Spain and Israel. Balance of trade between Spain and Israel. What Israel has done with other countries to increase the trade? Like, for example, the, the bilateral funds or any, any ideas that you can put on the table. Thank you. So regarding the government policy uh, on inequality, um, the government in the, in the, during the period of the crisis of 2002-2003, actually there was a very substantial reduction of uh, some of the welfare tra transfers that were motivated bo both by the need to uh, reduce the budget because we were in a crisis and at the time we didn't have the fiscal space to be able to just let the, the deficit go up. So partly there was a need to cut uh, the spending and partly there was a, a recognition that actually the relatively generous transfers that were uh, uh, given to people out of the labor force at the time uh, were part of the reason why at the time we saw a decline in the rate of participation in the labor market. So there was not enough of an incentive to actually be in the labor market. So that was then. And actually, uh, that had two effects. One, it had a short-term effect of increasing substantially the inequality. But it had a, another effect, a sort of more gradual effect, of actually increasing the entrance into the labor market because uh, the, the relative attractiveness of being in the labor market was, uh, was uh, enhanced. However, I think the one key missing element in the government's uh, uh, policy has been to actually equip the new entrants to the labor market with the right skills. And in, in many of my uh, discussions with the government, I stress the need to improve our educational system, not only the overall level, but also to reduce the inequalities in the uh, attainments within the education system and to spend more on vocational training, which in relative terms we spend very little. And so I think that it was correct to actually incentivize people to get into the labor market, but the second part is you need to actually give them the skills, provide them with the skills so that they can you know, successfully be uh, involved in the labor market. I think there is more to do on this front. Uh, in terms of the balance of trade, the truth is that uh, maybe the, the ambassador knows more about the kind of uh, uh, bilateral agreements, if there are, uh, between, uh, between Spain and Israel. It's uh, the kind of micro details that I'm not sure that I know enough about. And the gentleman that asked the actually knows even more than that. <laughs> He's the president of the of the Israel of the Spain Israel Chamber of Commerce, but of course uh, it reflects uh, an ongoing uh, uh, worry on our side, and to see to find mechanisms of increasing uh, 
increasing the exchange and uh, uh, from our embassy point of view of course we're interested in uh, balancing the our trade deficit uh, with uh, Spain but we welcome every of course every um, commercial uh, relation the the numbers do not quite I think uh, correct me if I am wrong but they don't reflect the service exports of Israel right or they do this is supposed to reflect the service this is a service this is the numbers are accurate yeah, I. This is what there is. No? The okay. Yeah, I, I understand that this is a. Yeah, I, I, I have that impression, but uh, service, uh, services are hard to measure, so we, we don't have a very accurate. Uh, yeah, but uh, in general, as uh, we share with uh, Gil, the you know. The, uh, curiosity to find ways to 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 do more in in a field that we all think that it's under performing. What, what surprised me about the distinction I don't see a reflection of the what I have expected, and, and that's it, to see the presence of the high tech uh, more pronounced, at least in these numbers. Maybe in reality, no, in reality, <laughs> I think in reality is different. Though some of the export imports are not measured directly to the customs, mm -hmm. so they, they, because they don't, not always they come from Israel. Maybe there are Israeli companies that. Uh, do things in Spain via, via another Other European country. country or the US. Then it wouldn't show in the numbers, and then so yeah, there might this be. this is only what goes to the customer. Directly, yeah. yeah. Directly. Yeah. But, but my question was for example, what Israel has done with some countries like US and Canada and Australia in terms of bilateral funds, do you think that's a good way to promote bilateral business, bilateral rela business relationship? And is, if, if, if it's possible to do now in Israel, I mean, like uh, the Bird Fund uh, many years ago and still on, is, mm -hmm. or the one we did with Quebec, no, I wonder if, if that's a good way. I, it sounds like a good way, but I'm not, I, I don't know enough about these uh, agreements and their effect. We have not studied that, so I, I don't. Those, those funds do have uh, an impact on, on R&D collaboration, industrial R&D, but uh, their relation with the trade numbers is, is weak. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, weak, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for the very good explanation, it really gives a very good picture. I was just wondering on some other uh, macroeconomic things that you can ma maybe you can comment on. Uh, what is the deficit situation over time? Uh, what is the effect of the defense budget on the overall compared to other countries? And then uh, the, the balance of trade, not only with Spain, but I mean generally, is it positive or, or negative? And finally, on the social part, uh, social security, coverage of health, education. Can you make some comments because you would like to compare it to what we know about in Spain? Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I didn't actually expand on the fiscal uh, front, but let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, first of all, in terms of the debt, which is probably the most important figure, actually Israel had made tremendous progress over the last 10 years. And uh, in 2002 or three, the debt to G public debt to GDP ratio was almost 100 uh, percent. Today it's 62 percent. So a tremendous decline, mostly as a result of high growth, which basically we grew out of debt. In fact, if I would have shown you the picture, there would be two lines. One which shows the Israeli debt going down, and exactly parallel, the debt of average OECD countries going up. So we used to talk about Israel as having very high debt, and the need to reduce it, but then we really reversed places. 
the current deficit of the government, the, the target deficit is 2.9%. It has been slightly lower, or actually it was lower, it was 2.1, if I'm not mistaken. Last year will probably be around, I don't know, uh, under the, the ceiling this year, which basically means that we will either stabilize uh, the debt at the current level or slightly reduce it, which, which basically we went, we underwent substantial fiscal consolidation, which is very important, especially I think for a country like Israel, you want to have the fiscal space in case there are all kinds of shocks that you will be able to respond and you will have room to respond. Uh, in terms of the budget aggregates, uh, overall spending in Israel is about 41% of GDP, which is somewhat lower than the average spending in, uh, in average OECD country. We spend about 6% of GDP on defense, which is about four percentage point more than yeah. average OECD country. Uh, and the overall civilian spending is about 30% of GDP, which is about 11 or 12% lower than the average OECD country. Now, this is a very important number because it means that what we spend on the combination of health, education, infrastructure, welfare, and so on and so forth is much more modest than the average OECD country. In fact, it's the lowest among, in terms of share of GDP, it's the lowest among OECD countries. So the, the low civilian spending comes from two things. One is that the overall taxation is somewhat lower than average, and the second is that we spend more on defense. So if you combine these two, this means that we are at the bottom of spenders on civilian uh, services. And uh, I think that actually I, I mentioned the fact that our educational system is not really provide or it is not coming up with the results that would ensure that people come to the labor market in the 21st century with the skills that will make them actually very successful there. And I think we have to make the system more efficient, but also spend more. On health, we have a very good health system, uh, and uh, it's public health, but it's being underfunded. So there is not enough investment going on to ensure that also in the future it will be as good. And, uh, you know, the Israeli population is younger than in other countries, so we have not yet reached the point point where aging population has expanded very much the, uh, the demand for health services, but it's going to happen. I mean, our, we are some years behind uh, European countries, but uh, if we look uh, 30 years forward, uh, the share of people over 65 will get, go up from something like 9% to 16%. So we we're going to age slower, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the, the Israeli population will also age. And I think we need to spend more investing now on increasing the capacity of the uh, health system, which, as I say, is very good, but it's very underfunded. Uh, on welfare, I think there is also more to do. So I think that it shows up the fact that we have a very slim uh, uh, public uh, civilian services shows up in the in the quality and especially also in the insufficient investment. Uh, about the balance balance of payments, uh, we are in surplus of about four percent of GDP, substantial surplus, which is one of the fundamental factors which actually pressures the exchange rate uh, towards appreciation, that's 
the element that we're not trying to, to offset because this is just a reflection of the relative strengths of the economy, including the trade bill sector, and also some transfers. By the way, we also have fairly high uh, foreign direct investment, which is uh, basically seeking uh, opportunities to invest mostly in our high-tech sector. So that's, again, it's very good uh, indication of that attractiveness of the high-tech sector, but it also pressures the exchange rate. So this is how these things work. The <laughs> pressure <coughs> compared to other countries, I mean the percent of ta taxes from the total budget, is it similar to other countries? Uh, we have our uh, share of GDP of taxes is about 30 percent compared to 34 percent on average in OECD country. So if you take the 4 percent lower uh, taxes and the 4 percent higher uh, uh, defense, that shows, no, that shows in the lower civilian spending bo on both sides. Yeah. So, uh, about taxes, maybe I should say, uh, when I say, a lot of times I would show this graph exactly with the numbers, and people in Israel are convinced that they're paying very high taxes. I think, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think probably it's not only in Israel. So first of all, the people that usually sit in the room where I talk are people at the higher, uh, you know, income tax brackets, so it's not a sort of a random sample. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there are fairly wide exemptions, uh, so even if the tax brackets are uh, suggest high, you have all kinds of ex exemptions, either due to geographical location of your activity and some other, all kinds. So I think that uh, we could raise raise the revenues quite substantially by reducing some of the uh, exemptions with a limited economic justif justification. Uh, thank you. You mentioned two factors uh, uh, relating to Europe. One, that it's about one-third of the trade uh, that you make, and also that you look at uh, the what the central banks and the economy is doing here, particularly quantitative easing. What is your view on what will happen when this QE stops? It will have to stop one day. Um, and what is your view of the effects it will have uh, in the economy and relating to you? Because, I mean, variable interest rates are uh, the majority of mortgages here. If interest starts going up, probably that will have a strong effect on consumption, etc. What is your view on what will happen when QE stops? Okay, so I, I won't try to comment about what will be the results in Europe, although I'm convinced that the central bank will take the steps to uh, reduce the very, very accommodative stance of monetary policy when the economy will be in such a shape that it will be, uh, you know, that growth and, and, and generally that the activity will be um, solid enough to justify that. So, but I, I won't go into the details of how it may affect here. I would say generally that uh, when it happens, uh, I think the circumstances from our perspective will be such that the global economy, including world trade, which is the particular uh, element that is very important for us, will be at better shape and higher growth. So that by itself would be a factor that would support the economy. And the lower uh, accommodation or higher interest rate or reduction in QE in general will reduce some of the pressure towards appreciation of our currency. So in that respect, I think it will uh, make things a bit easier for us. So you think that the, uh, there's no scenario where QE will stop without enough growth? Have to go uh, I think that uh, President Draghi made it very clear that he wants to make sure that the 
uh, that you know that uh, things are well enough underway before there is a, a reduction in the accommodation, a, yeah, monetary accommodation. Thanks. Um, I have, I don't know if, it, uh, more than a question, it's a request. We're very, very interested in the Israeli experience with the promotion of innovation and the, the high-tech sector. So we would be very grateful if you can send us references or places where to look at this in more detail. And if you ever have a visitor passing through who can speak about this, we'd be very happy to organize a seminar uh, and try to get the Spanish government to learn from your experience. Thanks.